This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Uh, our last speaker in this uh, session is uh, Jonathan Gillard. And I think uh, as evidenced by kind of the multidisciplinary uh, approach that uh, we're trying to emphasize in this uh, session over these two days, um, he really brings together many of the uh, elements that uh, you've seen here of trying to look uh, at a combination of morphological imaging, functional slash molecular imaging, as well as hemodynamic uh, assessment of uh, the vessel wall uh, in the carotid as well as in the aorta, and uh, particularly using MRI, so a nice balance to some of the PET work we saw here, uh, and, uh, and how that could be translated ultimately into studying uh, uh, AAA disease. So thanks uh, for making the trip all the way from Cambridge and uh, looking forward to your talk. Great. Um, I'd like to uh, um, thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, and I think the reason I'm here is this integration of, um, of the morphological, functional, and also the biomechanical components. In what uh, we're trying to do is have a, uh, a black box which uh, tells us what the risk of a, a disease in one vessel is. And that's what we're after. And, uh, and I think the biomedical components, are, biomechanical components of that are actually crucial um, because it's involved in etiology and also uh, um, and rupture. And I know there may be lots of arguments about the different processes involved in uh, what's important. But the thing is, I think for me, it's the fact that we can image those um, and image those in man. And uh, what I'll do uh, towards the end is actually show the, the value of using MRI in clinical trials at assessing risk and whether there actually is any, uh, any value in that. There is one uh, small disclosure. The, uh, as a radiologist, we're pretty good at uh, um, imaging uh, different uh, vascular beds, and um, with, uh, with MRI particularly nowadays, and of, of course we've he uh, heard of uh, the advantages of, um, of PET-CT. For me, one of my uh, interests is actually uh, um, working with uh, pharmaceutical companies in, actually, uh, is in assessing risk. And the, the problem that uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies have is when you're doing a, a clinical trial, um, you are stuck with a, a few rather hard endpoints um, uh, as far as uh, uh, what you need in a trial. And personally, if I was in a trial for coronary artery disease, I'd prefer not to be uh, one of these endpoints. I'd like to be, have, have a measurable endpoint uh, before that. And this is the, the, uh, the reason for actually producing other biomarkers, imaging biomarkers, which assess disease. And uh, um, the real reason uh, for, for developing these things is actually um, to early on in drug development for pharmaceutical companies is to know whether you actually need to abandon a, a drug or not, um, uh, whether it's not actually uh, um, uh, doing the job that it should be doing. And I'll, I'll show you towards the end is that you can do tiny clinical trials to show the value of certain drugs. Um, you don't need to do th studies of thousands of individuals. And even using biomechanical stresses, you can do studies with tiny numbers of individuals, uh, depending on the efficacy. So I'm going to concentrate uh, a lot on the carotid, but also showing some of our experience of the aorta, because what the take-home message is the fact that MR may provide you guys with something which is a useful tool for assessing different interventions that you, that you do in the, a the aorta. So I'm going to talk about morphology, I'm going to talk about inflammation, and I'm going to talk about stress. As I said, all in, in one sitting, one MR study. Okay, so we can do all of these things at once. There are some caveats uh, which I think one has to be aware of uh, when one talks about um, arterial disease, because I talked about all the different arterial uh, vascular beds, and the idea is that you take a drug which early on, before you get to the stage of aneurysm development or whatever, is that actually attacks all those, those vascular beds. Um, that is not actually necessarily true, um, because the fact is the, the etiology, and this is where things like CFD come in, uh, between the different disease beds is actually different. And when uh, um, I always have a, a slightly puzzled time with people doing calcium scores on coronary vessels, is that when we see calcium in a, um, a carotid, it's actually good, because it means you've got stable disease. Um, uh, that vessel is not going to erupt, um, is, is, is probably un, is less likely to embolize than the calcium. It's where it's the other components of the plaque. And we deliberately screen out people without calcium. And yet there's a whole industry out there measuring calcium scores for coronary artery disease. 
And originally, I never understood that. But uh, um, uh, now I do slightly, and I'll show you a, slide a, little, a little bit later, say, where, when calcium is important in arterial disease, um, in, in atheromatous uh, disease. So uh, there are differences between vessels and things like blood flow in the coronary artery is a, is a diastolic process, and in the carotid artery it's a systolic process, and that changes where you get the shear stresses, which are important in the development of those things. So one has to be careful about these things. The other thing is, um, is the, uh, um, the different components of, uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, arterial disease. And uh, one of these things is to do with, uh, as I said, calcium, but also thrombus, and there is this thing about whether with thrombus in uh, um, aortic aneurysm disease, whether that actually reduces your risk slightly of, of uh, rupture. And this is compounded within, within other vessels in the coronary and uh, carotid, where if you have thrombus, that increases your risk uh, quite considerably. So there are these differences which I think one, one has to be mindful about before one jumps in too much. And uh, um, this is just uh, an FEA uh, map of showing the, on the uh, left when you actually take calcium out, and on the, so you, um, and on the uh, right when you um, take thrombus out and you're getting increases, increased stresses when you take the thrombus out of the model. The other thing is there are certain limitations about the, the context in which we work, about the clinical trials that have existed before. And certainly in the uh, carotid is that uh, um, it's de de uh, the, um, uh, the trials are, are determined on luminal measurements. And I always remember our head of department actually pointing out saying, always beware the radiologist with a ruler. The problem with aortas is that's all you've got, um, and it's you know it's well uh, um, well designed uh, studies uh, can tell you where you have uh, risk. The problem for me was with uh, um, the trials associated with carotid disease is they was they were dependent on angiography, and this is uh, um, on the right is an image of uh, um, uh, an internal carotid artery. And if you had uh, if your radiologist did your angiogram from that direction, you would have a low degree stenosis. If you had your angiogram from that direction, you'd have a high degree of stenosis. So your management would be completely different. So this is a fundamental flaw of the NASET and ECS trials, but it was the best that was available now at, at that stage. And, it, it, and the thing is to change the way we actually work in assessing actual risk. And uh, my hope is over the next decade or so, certainly for um, non-aortic diseases, we'd go away from measuring anything, any luminal measurements. So luminal stenosis has always been historically the most important thing. The problem is it doesn't actually tell you what's going on under the, um, under the uh, endothelial surface, which is, uh, is crucial for rupture. So we can have two uh, um, cartoons here of uh, um, similar degree, identical degree of stenosis. And the thing that changes uh, from one which is of low risk on the left to high risk on the right is the fact that on the right you have those le red little beasts in there, those uh, macrophages and inflammatory infiltrates. You have a large lipid core and a thin vi fibrous cap. Um, and these are the things, if we can measure those, because we know there are certain measurements in the coronary artery of fibrous cap thickness which are associated with increased risk, that will help us with our black box of determining risk. We can use MR, um, uh, uh, which uh, um, in, in the carotid, um, in the aorta it's easy, it's, uh, um, of course it was a little bit more challenging, but then we can actually sort of target the areas of where you're actually looking at risk, and we can, what we want to do is actually t um, uh, uh, take out the, those components that we know are associated with uh, um, risk of uh, um, having an event. And so we can actually uh, use uh, multimodal um, imaging contrast to actually tease out the components within, within plaque. And as I said, what we're trying to do is find out whether we have this thin fibrous cap over this large lipid core. This is the Vesuvius of, uh, um, pre, before you have your uh, coronary event or your, um, uh, uh, your stroke. And uh, um, we've, over the last eight years or so, we've been validating these tools such that we can actually uh, look at these different plaque components. And uh, now we're pretty happy with what, uh, um, what they indicate for these, these key components associated with risk. And this is a, um, a stir image which is just showing a thick fibrous cap with a small lipid core. This person would be, in our view, be at lower risk of having a rupture. So, as I said, we can uh, look at these different components of uh, risk and we can measure them uh, uh, reasonably accurately now with MRI in a, in a single sitting. But again, uh, um, the problem is, is dissociating between the fact whether you've got a stable plaque or whether you've got a plaque which is actually prone to rupture and whether we can actually uh, um, look at that in more detail. This is uh, um, an individual with an acute uh, transient ischemic attack, and this is direct thrombus imaging showing the, the clot in the coronary artery, which is throwing off the emboli, giving the person the uh, symptomatic events. 
Plaque information has been uh, um, talked at, uh, um, talked of uh, pr previously, and the uh, the thing is whether we can actually image these di these uh, different components, and uh, um, whether we can image macrophages or um, other uh, uh, um, uh, materials such as MMP um, associated with this process. But it's a it's a real rag bag of um, processes within within the plaque, um, giving you this inflammatory uh, um, process, and inflammation is. Uh, implicated in a number of uh, disease processes now. Uh, certainly for arterial disease, it's uh, perceived as being a bad thing. Uh, certain uh, dementias, multiple sclerosis, uh, uh, the, the inflammatory reaction is a, a poor process. If you cut your finger, the inflammatory process is a, good, is a good reaction, and you want that. When you get into stroke, it's a bit more difficult about whether macrophages are good or bad for you, whether they're helping the healing process or not. So um, it depends on where the macrophages are and also what type of macrophage um, is actually involved. So on a very simple, simplistic level, and uh, I'm showing this because I'm going to show you an in vivo um, uh, study in a second, is you have the endothelial surface, you have your monocytes, which actually pass through the endothelial surface, and then what these do is uh, um, uh, uh, receptors uptake oxidized LDL, and you get the, this process whereby foam cells uh, um, are produced. And having a lot of foam cells uh, associated with the plaque is associated with um, increased risk. Um, and I said the challenge is whether you can actually image this process. We've known for um, uh, probably about seven years now, uh, we've been doing FDG um, PET of, uh, um, of carotids with James Rudd. And we're um, very happy, it's very confident with using uh, um, FDG. The problem is it's, it's a very sensitive trace, but it's non-specific, as the, uh, you know, clearly see a lot of signal coming out of the uh, um, spinal cord here. And no one's actually ever really explained this to me. But uh, there's been an explosion of studies now with um, uh, PET-CT because it's so easy to do, um, uh, uh, even though you probably shouldn't be doing it in diabetic patients. This um, uh, sort of, uh, in, sort of uh, um, area um, has become increasingly interesting when um, these uh, uh, ultra small particles of uh, paramagnetic iron oxide were, were introduced a number of years ago. And these were um, originally developed as blood pool agents. The idea was that uh, um, you could give an injection of a contrast agent, it would stay in the arterial system uh, for a long period of time, so you could do whole bottle body vascular imaging as part of an idealist screening process. Because you've got disease in one vessel, you've probably got disease somewhere else as well. But uh, um, as, as, sort of as, as a side effect of um, one of these agents, which uh, um, called Cinerem or Cobidex in uh, um, the US, is that it was noted that uh, um, the agent was taken up by macrophages and atheromatous plaques. And in human studies, um, it was also noted that you were getting uh, aortic uptake um, uh, with the screening uh, tool. The idea is that um, uh, you give the iron compound to someone in, on in oncological practice, and if you've got a lymph node with normal macrophages in it, they will, they will take the iron up and you get signal loss. If you've got tumour in the lymph node, the iron macrophages are not there, are not functional, and so you don't get a signal change. And so it's a method of looking actually for microscopic um, uh, tumour infiltration, which is being done in a number of studies at the moment. <coughs> So this is uh, an SPI with a slightly larger iron particle. This is a, a Kupfer cell. And basically, you can see that the um, iron particles are being taken up by the Kupfer cell. And so what we're doing here is going from the structural um, imaging to sort of function, to cellular function. And this is what we can, um, we can image with the USPIOs. So these are... Um, uh, basically, it's an uh, iron compound, and the, the, the crucial thing is the, is the coating, because the coating will determine about what, how, how that particle actually behaves. And the, the size is crucial um, the, with uh, Cinerem. This is uh, similar to oxidized LDL, is, is actually the size of the, the particle. And as I said, this gives you a, a black hole appearing on uh, um, normal MR sequences. So what happens is that you've got the... Uh, um, uh, uh, USPO in the in the bloodstream. You have monocytes. These uh, take up the iron particles, depending on which uh, um, sort of the type of particle that you're actually using, and then these get integrated into the foam cells with the oxidized LDL, and you get this blooming effect. So you get the signal loss, and this is what we can image um, with MRI. Um, as I said, particle size is important, and the, the, the downside is a negative contrast agent. But there are um, situations where it is a positive contrast agent, and this is. Uh, in this situation, pre-infusion and post-infusion, and we can see the fibrous cap enhancing. And the T1 effect, I'll, I'll mention in a little while. So what do we get? This is a baseline image. 
um, uh, T1 sequence, the stir image, looking at the fibrous cap. And then what we do, we have this uh, spiral image. This is uh, pre-infusion. Do baseline imaging, give the infusion of the uh, contrast agent. And then about 36 hours later, you actually see the, um, the USP effects. This is um, uh, showing us where macrophages are in the plaque. Um, and this is the thing that you can actually quantify, and now we can actually do um, quantitative TCU star mapping. But this, is, this is the type of signal change that you see. There's been a lot of validation over the years about whether the iron is actually in inactivated macrophages, and, and, it, and it is, and uh, smooth muscle cells don't take it up to any significant degree. And then when you do electron microscopy in the phagolysis zones, you can see these iron particles being deposited. So, deposited. so we know that the, the iron we're giving is actually appearing in macrophages um, as, to, as opposed to other cell types uh, predominantly. And so this is the, uh, the sort of the real life equivalent of what I was showing you with the, my cartoon, is this is a, a capillary with uh, monocytes um, containing, um, uh, this is SPIO passing through the endothelial surface going into the, um, into the vessel wall. So as I said, we've got a functional dynamic method of imaging um, an inflammatory process. Um, and it's not static when the iron gets deposited in the, in the, the plaque, it actually gets um, uh, integrated into your normal iron turnover and gets pulled out of the plaque eventually. Um, also, when uh, um, we, we can actually do, uh, produce uh, an antibody to the, the coating of the, um, of the uh, um, USPAO, and so we're even more confident that the USPAO is not, the signal effect we're getting is coming from the, the actual contrast agent we gave, as opposed to iron, which may have come from hemorrhage or so associated with plaque. So we're, we're pretty happy with it as a tool for measuring um, uh, inflammation. The interesting thing is, uh, is it, it actually changes clinical practice because now we can image uh, uh, inflammation. It, uh, we're looking at, for free, you get the other vessel uh, um, uh, imaged at the same time. And we have these slight conundrums, which is this is a symptomatic individual, pre-infusion, post-infusion, so a little bit of USPO uptake. This person had surgery on that, um, on that uh, side. But then in the contralateral asymptomatic uh, um, vessel, you have uh, pre-infusion, post-infusion. There's a lot of inflammatory activity. And this is the type of person who would normally be seen by the vascular surgeon post-surgery and then pushed away. And in fact, what the, the imaging is telling us is that from an inflammatory point of view, his, actually his other vessel is probably more at risk. And so this may change. This idea that we can image risk may change the way that we... Um, uh, 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 risk stratify patients in the future. I, I wouldn't say we're doing, going to do it nowadays, although we do, um, uh, but in, in, maybe in the future things like uh, FDG or whatever w will be used um, uh, to determine risk in an individual patient for personalised medicine. The other thing is uh, when you're actually um, imaging the vessels, we actually look at the brain, and uh, um, this is the brain pre-infusion and post-infusion, and what we have is USP uptake in the brain, and this is because of uh, uh, microemboli coming off the vessel and uh, you're seeing the secondary effect of that. And as, as I said right at the beginning, the macrophage effect here, it may be a positive thing in to do with, in, in to do with healing. I, I don't know the answer to that. So we've looked at uh, um, the morphological uh, components of plaque associated with risk. And uh, hopefully I've been able to sort of uh, entice you that we can actually look at macrophage infiltration with MRI. But there's more to, um, uh, there's more to this because we have a systemic disease. So this is an individual with uh, carotid with um, uh, uptake um, uh, near the endothelial surface, but also more peripherally, and this may be due to angiogenesis, um, where, where um, you're getting a, a, um, a lymphocytes deposited. And then the person actually had coincident uh, aortic disease, and again we're seeing this um, USPO effect both in the endothelial surface, oops, the endothelial surface, but also more peripherally. And this, the thing about angiogenesis is, um, is actually much more complicated than I thought originally, because I thought angiogenesis was bad. But uh, I was very interested with um, Valentin Fuster saying um, a little while ago that um, angiogenesis may be a good thing because it may actually help um, leach uh, oxidized LDL out of the, pro out of the, of the atheromatous plaque. And I said, we haven't explained fully how we get iron particles out of the plaque. So giving an, an anti-angiogenic drug to someone with this type of process may actually be counterproductive. Um, so I, I just think it's interesting that we, we're sort of rethinking 
um, sort of, uh, you know, how we actually deal with diseases and what actually are the key components and what's, what's associated with healing. But again, we've got clear disease in carotid and in the aorta in this individual. Then we can move on to uh, stress, and this is uh, a model from Chuck Kerber. I'm uh, just showing that the flow dynamics within a, um, uh, a model from a patient that died. And uh, this is just to flag the thing I said before about it depends on which vascular territory you're involved with things, with things like uh, endothelial uh, wall shear stress, about how important those are into the etiology of the uh, atheromatous disease or arterial disease, and also so, uh, what is associated with risk, whether it's high shear stress or low shear stress associated with the actual uh, rupture component. Um, but we can, we can do this, and we can do that this, uh, um, with uh, um, MR. So the, the, the modeling components we have are CFD, finite element, and uh, then we can look at carotid artery stiffness. And I'm being very loose in the, uh, um, what I mean by um, stiffness at this stage. So um, computational fluid dynamics is actually a very easy thing to do to get the data um, uh, with just phase contrast MR. The problem is the, 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 the great complexity with analysis, which uh, um, uh, this is the place to be um, if, you, if you need the answers for that in Stanford. But uh, it's a tool which we can do, and uh, it's, it's a very, very easy data to acquire. Fine element analysis, um, we've already heard of, and this is a method of actually looking at the interactions between materials in the, um, within the plaque and uh, to see what's associated with the rupture. And so in this situation, we've got pre and post USPO, we've got macrophage infiltration, and the uh, um, corresponding uh, uh, FEA map showing the, the links to high, high stresses within the uh, plaque wall, so that's where um, inflammation is. And these uh, um, two other cases where we've got a uh, um, uh, rupture in the middle of the cap, and then more conventionally in the shoulder of the cap, showing where we're get, you're getting maximized uh, um, stresses. And as I said, what we're trying to do is produce a predictive model about when, uh, whether you can predict whether an individual is going to have, the, have rupture. And so the biomechanical components and the inflammatory components, I think, are very, um, are, are very important to, to bring the data together, not to be looked at in isolation. And when we look at symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals, there are um, clear difference, statistical differences between the, the amount of stresses within plaques between those individuals. So it's sort of fitting in with the story that uh, um, we're, we're developing. And it gets uh, um, more interesting in some respects when we, as I said, when we're trying to co-localize um, uh, inflammation with um, mechanical stresses within uh, plaques when we segment our images. Um, produce our um, stress maps, and then uh, using USPO studies and then subsequent histology is actually to uh, co-localize these, uh, um, these events. So we have the macrophage collections within the, the plaque, and then if we actually uh, merge the, um, the data sets together, we see um, co-localization. And the problem I have at the moment is that, um, since I'm a simple neuroradiologist, is that um, the question is chicken and egg. Which, which thing comes first? Do you get the stresses locally, which um, uh, recruit macrophages to that area, or are macrophages involved in actually some of the, the, um, the, the components, you know, determining which components you have within the plaque? And so uh, you and the audience are probably much better at this than me. But the, the, the thing is, is that we can image it, and we can start associating these things with, with risk. Um, and then uh, what we, we can do, the three-dimensional three FEA um, modeling. And the, the thing that everyone really wants to do is to link in the FEA with the CFD. So you've got, uh, you've got those data sets which you can link together to actually, which is ultimately what we, what we need to do. But computationally, that's, you know, it's an enormous task. And, uh, um, but it's the thing that I think ultimately we need to get, get, get to together for whatever vessel one's looking at. Uh, just to throw in this conundrum about calcium, when I used to give uh, cardiologists hard times by saying, uh, why are you doing calcium scores? And by, by modeling, it's uh, stuff that was produced from uh, um, one of the guys in our uh, um, lab. It depends on where the calcium is in the plaque. If you've got calcium sitting way out in the, in the lipid core, there is no change, there's, there's no great risk associated with it. It's when calcium actually appears near the endothelial surface that risk goes up. So um, life gets even more complicated um, uh, when one actually brings the modeling into these, these things. 
The other thing to do is uh, looking at uh, carotid artery stiffness. And uh, as I said, what we want is this one-stop shot with MR looking at all these different components because you don't know the weighting of the different components that's most important. It may be finite element. It may be CFD. I don't know. Um, uh, it may be CFD is most important in, in the natural history of the disease, and FEA is more important with, um, uh, with, with, with rupture when anyone does an analysis. But the other thing is, is the overall effect on about the suppleness of the, uh, the carotid vessels. And uh, um, previously, this has been um, done uh, a significant amount of work using uh, um, uh, ultrasound, and there's, it is correlated with uh, carotid disease with coronary disease. Um, but the thing is, the problem is it's, uh, it's doing ultrasound is, is so operator dependent, there are issues with that when doing large scale studies um, uh, uh, um, on uh, different sites. And so there are methods now of using, um, uh, um, of using MR to actually look at carotid artery uh, stiffness. And one of the things to do is actually use the MR uh, source data and then use uh, um, like a cine MR, dynamic MR, just watching the vessel change shape. And uh, um, this is where uh, um, uh, a collaboration with um, astrophysics people in Cambridge um, has been a great advantage. Um, all this work is collaboration with engineering versus other groups. But in astrophysics, uh, it came up about um, we had noisy images. And physics, astrophysics people love noise because that's all they have. They have noisy images of, of uh, um, the sky. And where they see sort of uh, um, clustering of noise, they, that's where they start looking for planets. And so you give them a noisy image and they love it. And it's the opposite. If I see a noisy image, I hate it. But what they could do is actually use these noisy images and actually follow, produce software which actually follows the vessel wall um, during the uh, cardiac cycle. And so you can track the vessel wall mo movements, which you can actually start using for looking at uh, compliance measurements. I said this is in the same setting that we're doing the USPO studies and the plant morphology. It's not a, it's not a separate um, exam. So um, just uh, one of the other things we're doing is, is doing a method of modeling such that you can get the arterial input function for the carotid from a, a brachial measurement, which is uh, um, a thing we're doing in collaboration with Ian Wilkinson. So, is all this just a pretty picture? Does it mean anything? It, you know, does it, who cares? Do, um, is, is it going to change patient management or not? I don't know. Well, maybe it will do. And uh, what I'm going to show you now is the, um, uh, some of the results from uh, an athero the atheroma study, which uh, was released, as, as I said, um, uh, a few months ago. And this is basically a study using USPOs to assess um, uh, risk with um, high and low dose of torvastatin. The uh, novelty of this study is it uses inflammation as a screening test. And so this would be like uh, for the aortic aneurysms, I'm um, using FDG as a screening test about whether you're going to follow people, how you're going to follow people up, is that we're only targeting people who have USPO positivity. The reason for this is if you've got an anti-inflammatory drug and you're a pharmaceutical company, why are you giving it to someone who doesn't have inflammation in their plaque? So it's basically it's, it's population in enrichment, uh, which is what this is designed to do. Um, two, two doses of uh, atorvastatin. And the key thing is, is we're, we're, we're imaging at 6 and 12 weeks. Um, so this is really a short-scale uh, study using these biomarkers and also transdranal doctor ultrasound looking at emboli in the brain because we can actually <coughs> count emboli. And that, that would, that's the closest thing that we would come, from, um, come to uh, with a cl clinical correlate in a very short study. I was given a really hard, hard time by... Um, uh, someone at a, a meeting earlier in the year who said, you know, who cares with the inflammation? Why don't you just give people lots of aspirin? It's, uh, um, and the thing is to show that there is a correlate with that with um, uh, clinical events. And so it said there are um, three main points. The study wasn't pi powered to look at bio biomechanical outcome measures because I think you need much larger starts, but I will show you the data associated with that. Um, the reason for showing this slide is, uh, um, which hopefully forget, is, as I said, there's a, the T2 star effect is the thing where you've got lots of macrophages. This T1 effect is the thing which happens with low macrophages. So when I say there's a T1 effect, it means the macrophage, that there are only a limited number of macrophages in the plaque. But I think the, the physics we can leave. So what I'm going to show is a couple of uh, representative uh, um, patients. So this is uh, uh, a high-dose patient after randomization, pre-imaging, pre-infusion, post-infusion, seeing... Uh, accumulation of uh, USPO, this person's macrophage positive. Then we, uh, um, uh, six, uh, 12 weeks later, we have the pre-imaging, the post-imaging. Um, if anything, there's a little bit of enhancement here. So the significant difference in the, um, uh, the inflammatory burden after 12 weeks of drug. 
when we look at the uh, lipid profiles, and apologize for using SI units, is that uh, um, the key thing is the numbers go down. And so the, the lipid profile links in with this, the fact that we're getting an improvement in the imaging. Um, and as I said, negative numbers are a bad thing. Positive numbers are a good thing. So we've got more positive numbers. This means we, we think there's less inflammation within this plaque. A low-dose patient, similarly uh, baseline imaging, post-USPO infusion at uh, baseline and 12 weeks. And again, we have uh, um, uh, some signal loss here. There's background here anyway, but some signal loss and uh, limited changes at, uh, um, at 12 weeks. And then we look at the lipid profiles again, just looking at the numbers. There's no real change, which uh, confirms the fact that this is a, um, a, a low-dose patient. And I said negative numbers are bad. So actually, from baseline to 12 weeks, this person's got worse, and that fitted in with the, the, the clinical components. And uh, um, th this is just to show the fact that you do longitudinal with the longitudinal studies. There can, um, in this case, situation, there's uh, no change. Um, and one of the interesting things is what happens with uh, um, people who are on uh, um, the pre-dosing uh, equivalents of atorvastatin. Because if you're on a very low dose of something and you're randomized to 10 milligrams of atorvastatin, that's a four times increase in your statin dose. So the pre-statin loading, loading is, um, is crucial in this case. And this person actually got in improvement with more enhancement within the wall. And the, um, the stats bear this out with the, the amount of um, signal change. So this is highly significant between the, the high and low dose of statin on a study, a drug study with 20 people in each group. The original power calculation for the study was five in each group. Um, but we upped it, we, we doubled it to 10, um, or GSK doubled it to 10. And then I doubled it again because we couldn't take the chance that we would have a negative study for the contrast agent because that would mean there was no future for that contrast agent. So um, it's actually quite a powerful study um, uh, with hindsight. And also there's a significant change in um, emboli count. Um, so this is the signal chain from base, uh, baseline with the, um, this is the improvement more um, uh, on high dose of statin. When one looks at the uh, um, uh, CFD measurements, one of the things that uh, um, we see, and I said it's not powered for this, is that um, changes in uh, the variability um, in wall shear stress. And so this is, uh, this is um, uh, um, only a preliminary uh, analysis. Um, and again, just the, uh, it's the wall shear stress end diastole was the most significant change um, between high and low dose of um, and in, um, uh, in systole there was a change, but it wasn't significant at this, at this level. Again, with the finance element analysis, um, uh, there's a significant change between pre and post, and this is, is partly related to the, um, the inflammatory components. This is high dose of statin as a representative case. And again, with uh, crossed artery uh, stiffness, is that there's a, um, a significant improvement in individuals with, um, who are on high dose atorvastatin complain, contain, um, compared with low dose uh, atorvastatin. And the, the importance of that is it's, this is only a three month drug study. Um, and to get that change so rapidly, I think, is, um, is uh, um, quite important. So, and I said, the, the clinical correlates are the fact that on high dose atorvastatin, there are less emboli coming off the plaque on, um, in that group of 20 patients uh, around my stat compared with the, the low-dose do, um, low group. So this is the closest that we would get to saying that there might be a link with clinical endpoints, um, although this is only very early data. So what I've hoped to do is um, uh, just share with you some of the experiences of using MRI in a single MR sitting where we'll actually look at morphology, looking at those components that we know are associated with uh, risk, that we can look at cellular function by looking at inflammation and we can use contrast agents to quantify that. And uh, I, hopefully I've shown to you the fact that you can actually use this tool in drug studies, which I think is, is quite a big step to take for, um, a sort of a, for a novel contrast agent. And also to, to drop in the importance of the um, biomechanical processes associated with this, because I think it, they are crucial to be integrated into, into the, the black, bo black box measurement of, uh, uh, of risk, which is what we're, we're after. So um, you might notice that I didn't do this myself. Um, there are one or two people at home who um, uh, help out me, help with me, and uh, various other individuals and some of the funding bodies. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University.
please visit us at stanford.edu.